All right, you can turn in your Bible to Revelation chapter 15. Been a while since one of our Revelation studies. I had a few things, or have a few things going right now, but I was able to get into this scripture, and uh, it was actually kind of interesting because I, you know, I'll read through a chapter over and over and over and over and over again, and pray about it and say, "Okay, Lord, what do you want me to see here? Um, what, do, how do you want me to teach this for Bible-believing Christians?" And uh, it was just like I was stuck on it. I just could not. It's like, yeah, it kind of looks like that, but uh, yeah, but that, you know, this makes a problem with that. And I, yeah, okay, well, I reread it again. Yeah, okay, well, you know, it just wasn't going good. And this break that I took from these Revelation studies is just what I needed because coming back to it, all of a sudden it's just like the Lord opened up my eyes and I'm going, wow, pretty incredible stuff. Going to be a good study. Verse 1, Revelation chapter 15, verse 1. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. What was the word there? I saw another sign in heaven. Who are the signs for? Go back to Mark, the book of Mark. Sure, you have been saved for a while. I'm sure you know where I'm going with this, but... I'm going to show you something interesting today that I don't think a lot of people have seen. Mark chapter 16, starting in verse 17. It says here, And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Okay, After Jesus dies on the cross, there's a, a period of transition where the gospel is first sent to the Jews and then later also to the Gentiles, both Jews and Gentiles. It wasn't two bodies of Christ like hyper-dispensationalists teach. Okay, again, I, I get confused. Or people accuse me of being a hyper dispensationalist. It's like you don't understand what hyper dispensationalism is. You're showing that you're a very weak student of uh, scripture and things related to scripture. Hyper dispensationalists teach there are two bodies of Christ. The first one that comes is to the Jews. They're preaching the gospel of repentance and baptism. Okay, second one comes with Paul. The you get into this mid acts dispensationalism stuff and. And you know, and then they get on into all these little arguments and things, and and you know, it just it gets ridiculous after a while. And they pretend that Paul was preaching to the Gentiles, and Peter continued to preach Acts chapter two, basically to the Jews. It's like no, they were preaching the same gospel. It transitioned, and when Paul shows up, Peter is saying, yeah, okay, they you know they have they're meeting together and stuff, and it's like okay, the Lord showed you this, yeah, let's preach that. So they're preaching the same gospel after the, it's revealed to Paul, right? It's, you know, the church age is, is kind of, uh, of, it's transitioning, it's revelation that comes through, right? It's not two different bodies of Christ. That's heresy. That's stupid. And there's a lot more about hyper-dispensationalism we could get into, but that'll be for another study. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Let's think about the signs being for the Jews. I'll show you the proof of that. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 22 through 24. For the Jews require a sign. They require a sign. Study the whole Bible. Signs the whole way through it. And the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block. And unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. All right? Um, I stopped at the word stumbling block for a very important reason. What is the stumbling block in that verse? We preached Christ cruci crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block. Jesus Christ came and he died on the cross to pay for your sins if you're Jewish. And if you're Gentile as well. But understand something. The Jews, they look and they say, well, no, the Messiah is supposed to come and he's going to bring in all this other, you know, world peace and things like this and the kingdom and he'll be ruling and reigning from Jerusalem and all that stuff. Well, that's at the second coming. 
But you see, the fact is, the Jews, he came to his own, own and, and his own received him not. Right? They rejected him as their Messiah. And that's New Testament teaching. Plainly New Testament teaching. That does not mean that God cast away his people. Read Romans chapter 11. He did not cast them away. Right? And you say, well, how can they be his people if they reject Jesus Christ? It's called a covenant that was made to physical seed. And the Roman Catholics come along and they say, we're going to eliminate that physical seed and we'll teach replacement theology that it's no longer physical descendants of Abraham. Now it's spiritual descendants of Abraham. That's what the Roman Catholic Church teaches. That's why they believe that they have taken over the priesthood. That's why they believe that they have, you know, they're like the modern day Levitical priesthood. All right, that's why laity can't get into that system and just say, well, you know what, the Bible teaches. That's why they kept the Bible from the people. All right, that's their whole system. That's very important to realize that. But you see, to a Jew, they hear that and they go, but our Messiah is supposed to come bring it all at the same time. Jesus didn't do it, so he's not our Messiah. And they leave out a whole bunch of other things in Scripture there, which that's a whole other study. But you see, it's a, it's a uh, stumbling block to a Jew to hear about Jesus Christ dying on the cross to pay for their sins. But let's focus on this word stumbling block. I'm going to show you something very interesting. Isaiah 57. Let's go back to the Old Testament. The Lord gave me kind of an interesting thing here. Never saw this before, doing this study. I thought, you know, I wonder if the Bible, what the Bible says about the word stumbling block. Pretty interesting here. Isaiah 57, verse 13 through 14. It says here, When thou criest, let thy companies deliver thee, but the wind shall carry them all away. Vanity shall take them, but he that putteth his trust in me shall possess the land. Are the Jews possessing the land today? Yeah. They've been brought back in unbelief. Ezekiel chapter 36 talks about that. They're possessing land. He that putteth his trust in me. You say, well, they, they deny Jesus Christ. It's talking about the Lord back here. Jesus Christ hasn't come to the earth yet. They have their system of worshiping God and things like this. They trust in God and things. Yeah, they do. They reject Jesus Christ. But the Lord's going to fix that up real soon in the time of Jacob's trouble. He's going to send Moses and Elijah to preach Jesus Christ to the Jews. And all of a sudden they're going to realize, hey, that was our Messiah. The ones that get saved, a lot of them are going to reject, still reject, and they're going to go to hell. They're going to die. It's going to be a terrible time of persecution for the Jews. But look at this. He that putteth his trust in me shall possess the land and shall inherit my holy mountain. The millennial kingdom. But look at verse 14. And shall say, cast ye up, cast ye up, prepare the way, take up the stumbling block out of the, out of the way of my people. I thought that was kind of interesting. Take up the stumbling block, Christ crucified. Jesus Christ died on the, on the cross. Well, what do you get if you get saved? You put your faith in Jesus Christ, you become part of his body. Right? So that's why when Jesus, or when Paul's on the road to Damascus, Jesus says to him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Saul, at that time, later Paul, is persecuting the body of Christ. Christians. But Jesus says, you're persecuting me. The stumbling block there is Jesus Christ. His death, burial, and resurrection. That's a stumbling block to the Jews. It's our salvation. So look at this. Take up the stumbling block. Christians, out of the way of my people. Did you know that pretty soon our time is up here on this earth? Prepare the way. What's the way? For the Messiah to come back. He was here the first time. They rejected him. But he comes back down at the second coming. You have to prepare that way. But first, that stumbling block that's mentioned over in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, the stumbling block has to be taken up. Hmm. How about that? Another argument for the rapture being before the time of Jacob's trouble. Posties will never get it. They won't get it. Well, it doesn't teach that. You're picking verses out and taking them out of context. 
spiritually dead. Go back to Revelation chapter 15. Show you another one. It's good stuff. You know, it's, it's interesting because as, as I've gone through the book of Revelation, I'm seeing many times that there's actually verses in Revelation that are proving a catching away of the body of Christ before the time of Jacob's trouble. Pretty interesting stuff. Here's another one. Verse 2. This is a good one. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. I don't see it. I don't see where the, the argument for the rapture is. Here's where it's interesting. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and look at this, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and the other things there. The saints in the time of Jacob's trouble, they have to get victory. It's up to them. You see? See, why is that? Well, let me show you first of all what's there for a Christian. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Does the Bible ever say anything about Christians getting victory? Let's look at it. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51 through 58. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Very famous verses about the rapture. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? There's two other references. The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. Here's the third one. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Question. Who gets the victory there? So we do when we're called up to be with the Lord and you know we don't die and things like that and, and whatever. Yeah, sure, that's true. But do we have a part in it? No. The victory that we have as Christians is not dependent on what we do. It's dependent only on our relationship with Jesus Christ and what He does through the Lord. Look at this. Or, you know, through show you here, verse 57, But thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. His imputed righteousness comes to us. That's the victory that we have. But it's not true of the saint in the time of Jacob's trouble. Turn back to Revelation 15. Revelation 15. Look at it again, verse 2. And them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name. They get the victory because of what they've done. You say, what have they done? Revelation 14, verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Matthew 24, verse 13. Turn there. I want you to see it. I was just going to quote it there from memory, but turn there. So that's what you're going to get from this ministry. I'm going to have you get a King James Bible, and I want you to turn there so you're actually looking at the words and reading the words yourself. I'm not going to put, put verses up on the screen, fancy text and all the other stuff and animation. I can do that stuff. I've done that in some videos. But in these Bible studies, I want you to turn in a paper King James Bible. I want you to see the verses yourself. It's important. Matthew chapter 24, verse 13. But he that shall endure until the end, the same shall be saved. So in verse 2 there of Revelation chapter 15, you have them that had gotten the victory over all the different things. They have to endure to the end to be saved. There are works involved with salvation. But if you look at 1 Corinthians 15, there are no works involved in our victory. 
our victory comes at the rapture. Because that's when we leave these corruptible bodies behind. That's when it's all over. No more temptation to sin. No more thinking of death and the pain and the headaches and the whatever else. It's done. Victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. But these people here in Revelation 15 too, they don't have the victory like that. They don't have the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. They have to endure to the end. You see the message that you get into when you become a postie? And of course, they'll, they'll twist this stuff and tweak it and all kinds of stuff. It's just amazing. All right. Verse 3. Revelation chapter 15, verse 3. And here we continue with this. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Um, why would a Christian today sing the song of Moses? But when you have people that, uh, over in Revelation 14, verse 12, says, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God. Who are the commandments given through? Moses and the faith of Jesus. They sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. It's called uh, comparing Scripture with Scripture. All right? Look at the verses. See how they line up. Then go back to the Pauline epistles and see if it lines up there. You say, wait a second, this causes contradictions. Well, then they can't be speaking to the same groups. See, understanding the Bible is actually fairly simple when you're honest. You know what I mean? <laughs> Verse 4. It says here, Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy. Amen to that. For all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. Praise the Lord. I love that verse. So important. Acts chapter 4. I'm going to read the words of Pope Peter I. You know... <laughs> To all the Catholics, all my Catholic viewers out there, let's read from Pope Peter the First. You know, that's what you believe. You believe he was the first pope. I don't. I think pope is a ridiculous title, but let's go with it for a minute here. Let's see what Pope Peter the First has to say. Acts chapter four, verse eight through thirteen. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, He's speaking ex cathedra. You see, ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel. If we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught by of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. I could say a whole lot on that verse, but verse 12 is the key here. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. I wonder what happened over the centuries. Why have the popes departed from that very teaching? I mean, you know, I'm a little rough on the popes and stuff like this, and I have good reason for it, but uh, I'd probably take it easy on the pope a little bit if he would just come out and say that. Just come out... Francis, Pope Francis there, you know, whatever, uh, Mr. Jesuit, why don't you come out and say what Pope Peter said? Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. Revelation chapter 15, verse 4, for thou only art holy. Muhammad is burning in hell. He wasn't a Catholic. Just go with it here for a minute. Buddha, he wasn't Catholic, burning in hell, and every one of his followers. Every Muslim out there, all of whatever, how many, hundreds of millions and whatever else, 
billion or whatever it is now, you're all going to burn in hell. You have to put your faith in Jesus Christ. Be part of the system of Jesus. Try to sound Catholic here for a minute. <laughs> yeah, like I could do that. But preach that. But you see, that's what's going to be happening up in heaven. Right there. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy. For all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. You know, the big game changer for Christianity is the book of Revelation. You see, there's an awful lot of people right now that are just walking around and they are self-righteous, they are prideful. They can mock this book and they can put this book down and, you know, the little blasphemy challenges and, and oh, where's your, your sky wizard and your this and that and fairy tales. and stuff. But guess what, little honey child? Let me tell you something. When the book of Revelation is coming to pass before your face, all of a sudden, the tune's going to change. And we're starting to see it, by the way. These are just the uh, beginning of sorrows. Have a study on that. You know, you look and you see people in the flooding and the, and the wildfires burning homes down and earthquakes and mudslides and avalanches and buried people buried alive and all this stuff. That hasn't even started yet. God's wrath, God's judgment hasn't even started yet. And you say, well, you're so cruel, you're God so cruel. I'm offering you a way out. I'll tell you how to be saved. You can get out. You can leave. You don't have to go through it. You know? I mean, God does everything. Here, salvation, just call upon me. Just ask for it. I'll give it to you. You know? Why does your God so cruel? Ask. <laughs> just, just ask Him for salvation. Realize you're a sinner. Come to Him and say, I'm a sinner. I, I, I can see it. You know, yeah, I'm, I'm convicted. I, I don't want to live like this anymore. You know, please save me. <laughs> Easy. Simple. I don't know. I'd have to see more proof. <laughs> okay. You're going to see more proof. It's called the book of Revelation. For thy judgments are made manifest. You can see them. That's why people in that time are going to be saying, yeah, I think it was God. It was Jesus. But here's the other interesting part about it. What happens at the second coming? Turn back to Zechariah. Back in your Old Testament. The minor prophets that come right before the New Testament starts Zechariah chapter 13, verses 1 and 2. In that day there shall be a fountain open to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will cut off the names of the idols out of the land, and they shall no more be remembered. But all, and also I will cause the prophets and the unclean spirit to pass out of the land. Wow. You talk about some good stuff. You say, well, what is that? What's, what's that whole thing there? I'll read it one more time. Revelation 15, verse 4. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? Is he going to be glorified when he's in Jerusalem? Yeah. And uh, his name's Jesus. Okay, that's the name that's going to be glorified. For thou only art holy. That's what Peter said in Acts chapter 4, verse 12. For all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. Here's the exciting part about this. I believe very firmly that the rapture is very, very close. I mean, right now, world news, Donald Trump goes and he's meeting with all these Muslim leaders and stuff like this. And where does he go next? To Jerusalem. What does he do when he gets off the airplane? He goes, first of all, to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. The Church of the Holy Sepulchre, brethren, is where high-level Jesuits meet. There was a woman I heard the one time in an interview, and she was she's a Jew, lives in Israel, citizen of Israel. And she said she went and she got into this Church of the Holy Sepulchre, and she said they were doing satanic ceremonies there. So it was a really, really wicked place. Eric John Phelps talked about it. He said that that's where some of these guys, these high-level Jesuits, knights of, equestrian, knights of the equestrian order. I mean, these guys are like the most powerful people in the world. 
and they meet at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Why did Donald Trump go to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre when he gets off the plane in Jerusalem and the high there to Benjamin Netanyahu and everything and goes right to the Church of the Sepulchre, the Holy Sepulchre, where the Knights of the Equestrian Order are? And then you see him, he goes from there, his little time in Jerusalem, he goes to the Vatican. So he goes to Jerusalem, meets with Jesuits there, and then he goes over to the Pope, the Jesuit there, Francis, the Jesuit. And Trump himself is Jesuit, Jesuit educated at Fordham University. And what are they talking about? What are they talking about? We need to bring peace to the Middle East. That's what the Antichrist is going to do. Do I believe Pope or that uh, uh, Trump is the Antichrist? No, I don't. I don't believe that he's the Antichrist. I don't believe that he could inspire worship, worldwide worship of himself. I believe that the Antichrist is going to be a man that's going to be revealed after the body of Christ leaves. Okay? But it's very interesting. They're making such a big push for this. And for you atheists out there, because I know that some of you out there, you will listen to me and stuff because I'm a little bit, you know, I give you some arguments and things like that that you haven't considered before and whatever. And, uh, you know, I pray for you that you, you know, drop the self-righteous pride and actually get saved. But let me just say this. How is it that some old book of fairy tales can say something that's going to happen thousands of years before it does? And I'm talking about the prophecies in the book of Daniel that talk about this man showing up that's going to bring peace, this covenant between Jews and Arabs in Jerusalem. Peace between the two. Prophesied thousands of years ago in the book of Daniel, and yet it's come to pass today. What do you do with that? This thing is getting close, brethren. So, what's my point I'm trying to make here with Revelation chapter 15, verse 4? Do you realize... If the rapture happens in the next year or two, or even a couple years from now, whatever, this passage, you know, thou only art holy, for all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest, and the names of all these other idols and false religions being cut off. Do you realize we're only a, only a few years away from that thing happening? Think about that for a minute. Okay? <laughs> I mean... All these people, all this religious stuff and all these wicked denominations out there and all the Protestant you know, apostasy and all the Catholic wickedness and all the Muslim and all this other stuff and everything else, a few years from now, possibly 10 years or less from now, it's all over. And you're worried about it? I gotta preach to myself, <laughs> you know. I mean, yeah, it's a bad thing to see Jesuits taken over openly and things and this and that and whatever else. Brethren, it's just a few short years and it's all gonna be over. We're close. How are you spending your time again? Let's finish up here, verses five through eight. And after that I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. And the seven angels came out of the temple, having the seven plagues clothed in pure and white linen, having, and having their breasts girded with golden girdles. And one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God, who liveth forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God, hmm. and from his power. And no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. Very interesting. Has this uh, smoke from the glory of God and from His power, has it ever been in the Bible before? Yep. Go back to Exodus chapter 19. I've talked about this in other studies, but I'll repeat it again because it's a good one. Exodus chapter 19, beginning in verse 10. I want you to think about the rapture as we're reading this. Okay? And the Lord said unto Moses, Go unto the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their clothes, and be ready against the third day. For the third day the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people 
upon Mount Sinai. And thou shalt set bounds unto the people round about, saying, Take heed to yourselves that ye go not up into the mount, to, or touch the border of it. Whosoever toucheth the mount shall surely, shall, shall be surely put to death. There shall not an hand touch it, but he shall surely be stoned or shot through, whether it be beast or man, it shall not live. When the trumpet soundeth long, they shall come up to the mount. And Moses went down from the mount unto the people, and sanctified the people, and they washed their clothes. Okay, let me just stop there for a minute. Remember the in verse 13, the trumpet soundeth long. You know, they shall come up to the mount. What are we listening for, brethren? A voice, as it were, a trumpet. The trump of God that sounds. Interesting. Uh, read verse 14 again here and then go down through. Uh, and Moses went down from the mount unto the people and sanctified the people, and they washed their clothes. And he said unto the people, Be ready against the third day, come not at your wives. And it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount, and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud, so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the nether part of the mount. And, Mo and Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke, because the Lord descend descended upon it in fire, and the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mount quaked greatly. You can almost say it's like, uh, you know, smoke from the glory of God and from His power. Interesting. Verse 19, And when the voice of the trumpet, the trump, that's what you see there. And I'm not talking about Donald Trump, okay? When the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed louder and louder, Moses spake, and God answered him by a voice. Hmm. And the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mount, and the Lord called Moses up to the top of the mount, and Moses went up. That's going to happen in the time of Jacob's trouble. Very interesting. Moses and Elijah are called up. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go down, charge the people, lest they break through unto the Lord to gaze, and many of them perish. And let the priests also, which come near to the Lord, sanctify themselves, lest the Lord break forth upon them. And Moses said unto the Lord, The people cannot come up to Mount Sinai, for thou chargest us, saying, Set bounds about the mount, and sanctify it. And the Lord said unto him, Away, get thee down, and thou shalt come up with, come up thou and Aaron with thee. But let not the priests and the people break through to come up unto the Lord, lest he break forth upon them. So Moses went down unto the people and spake unto them. I thought that was rather interesting. You see, at some point in time, the first part of the first resurrection there is the Old Testament saints. Those that were sleeping, they went up. Many of the bodies which you know slept. You know, uh, many, of the, many of the saints which slept arose. Their bodies came up after the resurrection of Jesus Christ uh, when he came, you know, up from the grave. The saints also came up with him, all right? I believe Old Testament saints went up with Jesus Christ. You know, I don't believe they're going to have to come up at the rapture or something like this. They're already up there. So it's kind of interesting. It's like you see a sort of a similar thing here to what's going to happen at the rapture. There's a trumpet, a voice like a trumpet, and says, come up. Moses goes up. And what happens to Moses, though? The Lord says, go down and speak to the people. That's going to happen in the time of Jacob's trouble. Another reason why it's Moses and Elijah, the two witnesses, not Enoch and Elijah. That's nonsense. Again, I've talked about that in greater detail in other studies, but let's look at, uh, go to next to Exodus chapter 20. The next chapter, just go right over. Exodus chapter 20. Verses 18 through 21. What happens when Moses speaks to these Jews in Exodus? And again, in the future, I believe. Verse 18. And all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountains, mountains smoking. And when the people saw it, they removed and stood afar off. And they said unto Moses, Speak thou with us, and we will hear. But let not God speak with us, lest we die. And Moses said unto the people, Fear not, for God has come to prove you, and that his fear may be before your faces, that ye sin not. And the people stood afar off, and Moses drew near unto the thick darkness where God was. Interesting. Keep your finger right there. Let's look back at Revelation chapter 15 one more time. What did uh, Moses say there? 
Moses said unto the people, Fear not, for God has come to prove you, and that his fear may be before your faces. Revelation 15, verse 4, Who shall not fear thee, O Lord? Hmm. Very interesting. You know, and the people stood afar off, and Moses drew near unto the thick darkness where God was. And what do they sing in verse 3? They sing the song of Moses, the servant of God. Very interesting. So you go back to the beginning, the sort of the founding of the nation of Israel. There are the early parts of the nation of Israel. God brings it full circle, right around. So they're back right there. God says, you rejected me back there on the mountain. You wanted Moses to speak to you. Okay, I'm going to give you Moses. But he's going to come again the second time in the time of Jacob's trouble. Going to be coming down and he's going to witness to you about Jesus Christ. He's going to come along and he's going to say, Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy. For all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. When you look at this world, brethren, and it gets so incredibly vexing, <laughs> ugh, understand, it's just about over. God's just about done with this whole thing. He's about ready to wrap it up. His judgment is soon going to be made manifest. People aren't going to laugh at this book in the future. The Bible says back in Revelation chapter 6 that people are going to be beheaded for the Word of God. So right now, you're going to suffer a little bit as a Christian. You're going to have people mock you. You're going to have put people putting you down and uh, making fun of this book. But they're not going to laugh very much longer. They're not going to mock the name of Jesus very much longer. So that is going to be it for Revelation chapter 15. Um, really another neat, encouraging study, you know, and... Uh, just, I, I don't know, it's just really interesting to see some of these connections and how things tie together. Um, so, a um, little quick update on the property issue, uh, just to let people know what's going on. Um, the place, our, our land and the buildings that I built and everything, um, it's all up for sale right now. So, um, if there are people that know about the property and whatever else, just, you know, please, please allow us to have some privacy, okay? I'll be posting links to the property and stuff, and oh, you know, until it. Um, just, just respect our privacy a little bit, okay? Uh, it just, you know, it gets kind of on my nerves after a while. You know, people just have to know everything about us and stuff. It, brethren, come here. You read the Word, okay? This, that's what this ministry is all about, the King James Bible. Um, I'm just a, I'm just a preacher. I'm just a servant. You know, good night. Don't worship me. You know, I, I had a brother recently kind of exhort me and he said, brother, you know, he said about my ministry the one time it's, you know, this ministry is the Lord's ministry and things. And he speaks through. Yeah, I know that. I know that. I'm not trying to be prideful. I'm not trying to, if I say my ministry has bears fruit and whatever else, there are times you have to speak foolishly and remind people I'm not just some loser behind a camera or something. I have ministry that I do offline. You know, I don't record those things. Uh, it's personal dealings with people. I'm not going to record it and get the drama going and stuff. Oh, I got somebody crying. And I don't do that, right? I have a life outside of the internet, right? So if you could please pray that somebody could come along and buy the property. We want to move on. You know, we just, we need to find a place. Uh, you know, it was something we prayed about. We felt the Lord's direction. Uh, the Lord, the Lord will lead you and He'll direct you. Sometimes you'll just be going. You're you're in a situation and you're kind of scratching your head, going, "I don't know how in the world the Lord's using this. You know, <laughs> I don't understand." He is. Um, if the Lord's done using you, He'll uh, He'll kill you and take you home. All right. The Bible says, "Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of His saints." All right. If if the Lord's all done with you, you're going to go home to be with Him. Uh, so in other words, if you're still alive. He has a purpose for you being alive in the very situation that you are in. All right. So remember that. Okay. Um, but yeah, if, if, you know, we really need prayer right now because we just, we, we need to move forward and, and uh, you know, 
just to kind of say it one more time, you know, we originally had bought the property so we could build there and we lived in this place here, run the ministry from this place here, and eventually be able to move over to there and have a little office in town or something like that. That was the intention. Uh, that's not how things worked out. Uh, many times the plans that you have for your future don't always work out. But uh, I got to just give a little testimony, another thing too. Um, we had looked at another place back months ago and actually made an offer and um, it fell through. And at the time it was just like, I don't understand. Everything looked great. I mean, it was in the winter and it, like a lot of the property was covered under like three feet of snow, you know, sometimes deeper. And, um, and it was just like, we were so confused and just kind of hurt and like, I don't get it. I don't understand. Well, we set up another appointment to look at this thing and just like, okay, Lord, I, you know, we're going to just go look at it again because they made kind of another little counter offer thing and stuff. And, and, um, you know, so we went and we looked at it and, uh, and went there just a couple days ago and it was just like, oh, wow, <laughs> the Lord totally protected us. Um, like I said, I was kind of hurt before that this, we didn't get the place. And I was kind of like, Lord, I don't understand. I'm trying to provide for my own here and everything. <laughs> and then going back and actually seeing it when the snow's not there and more things are happening and whatnot, uh, it was in much worse shape than I had realized. Um, very, very, very bad shape. And if the Lord had allowed us to get it back a few months ago, um, we would have actually taken possession of this, this property on the 24th of May. And I can tell you right now, it would have been a huge mistake. And uh, I just was absolutely blown away how the Lord protected us like that. And just, and I just, you know, brought me conviction. And I was just like, oh, I'm so sorry, Lord. I questioned you. I thought, you know, I was a little bit bitter and a little angry and just like, I don't understand why we couldn't get this place. And what, now I understand. And uh, just wanted to tell that story, just a little bit of, of uh, encouragement to you out there. There's going to be some times that you're going to have that similar situation where you're going to be like, Lord, I don't understand. I, I really wanted this or I really was going to do that. I don't understand. Why did this fall through? He'll reveal it to you eventually. Um, again, you know, I, I had relationships in the past with, with uh, different women and things. And, and I'd think, okay, she's the one I'm going to marry. Definitely for sure. And it'd fall apart. You know, they'd dump me or I'd be forced to dump them or whatever. It just, it'd be bad. And um, I always thought, you know, Lord, do you just want me to be single the rest of my life? I guess I'll just be like the Apostle Paul, I, I guess, <laughs> you know. Well, now I understand why. The Lord had my wife chosen for me, and it just had to wait for the right time to bring us together. And uh, he'll do that. He will direct your path if you'll let him. You want to go your own way and be stubborn and things like that and resist his word and resist the Holy Spirit telling you what to do? Well, then... You're going to suffer for it. But you just put your hands in, or put your life in God's hands. Just say, okay, Lord, I give up. I messed up my life up to the point of salvation. That's why I came to you as a sinner, broken, saying, I'm just, I don't want that anymore, that old life. You just, you take over. Just take over. I put my faith completely in what you did on the cross for me. I believe what your word says about this thing. I believe that you died for my sins. I'm here. Please save me. You do that, He'll save you. And then you come along and you say, Okay, Lord, you know what? Your word says it. I'm going to live it. You have the weird people out there, these professing Christians. Well, yeah, the Bible says that, but it's just not for today. Why not? You know? I mean, if the Bible tells you to do something, uh, don't you think it might be there and we can do it today too? You know? So, uh, that is going to be it. Um, please do keep us in your prayers. Uh, we really do need, uh, we're praying very fervently about the thing selling just because we just need to move on. Um, we need to get a place and, uh, you know, we're praying about that. We're going to be doing some searching around. And again, you know, as we're searching, it's just like, okay, Lord, uh, where do you want us to go? Um, it's not going to be about finding the perfect, idyllic, you know, little happy place where we never get bothered or whatever else. Um, wherever, we'll, wherever the Lord wants us to go is where we're going to go. So 
that's going to be it. Not sure when I'm going to be getting to Revelation chapter 16, but uh, looking forward to getting through the rest of the books of Revelation. Then I've got a bunch of other projects to do, bigger projects and things coming up. So uh, that's going to be it. Thank you very much for your encouragement, too. I don't say that enough. Thank you for those who donate to the ministry. Always appreciate that. But thank you for those who encourage us. That means a lot with your comments, with your letters, with emails and things like that. We really appreciate it. So we will see you in the next study.